First of all, I absolutely love my job because I get to tell you something that you love is good for you, which doesn't always happen. Um, I'll apologize in advance because um, we had to put my presentation on a different computer, so the fonts are probably going to not look very good. I also have a lot of information. Um, potential conflict of interest, I'm the CEO of uh, Dance Plan, which is a health technology company. I co-created a uh, weight loss program with stuff on DNA, and part of this presentation will be discussing um, mechanisms of sleep in relation to uh, weight control. This is a very cute video that's not on this hard drive of a kid falling asleep at the wheel. Um, I'm, I'm gonna give you a state of the union of sleep today, talk a little bit about some very important milestones in sleep history, then talk about the importance of that, important aspects of the sleep-wake cycle, um, aspects that are controlling the sleep-wake cycle, so neurophysiology, and then chronobiology, so aspects of circadian rhythm that matter, and, uh, and how restorative sleep is. And then again, like I mentioned, as, um, how sleep and weight uh, work with one another. Okay, so let's start off with how sleep has changed. Um, around the turn of the century, in, uh, the 20th century, average sleep times were around somewhere between eight and a half to nine hours per night. Around 1960s, they were around eight and a half hours per night, and they've been on a slow decline since then, or actually fairly rapid decline, I should say. So on average now, Americans spend six and a half hours of time in bed during the week, and on the weekends, they try to catch up with sleep, so they're getting seven and a half hours during the weekends. All right, now, when you look at this magnitude of sleep loss compared to the clinical literature, you see that this is actually a very significant amount. And we're gonna talk about, you're, you'll see some of the examples that I show uh, where this is clearly illustrated. What kind of impact does sleep have, sleep loss have on our society? Well, we see that it is the cause or related to about 100,000 car accidents per year, 40,000 injuries, and 1,500 deaths. And there's actually also, this is a huge cost. There's also a monetary cost, which is about $16 billion in direct expenses and $100 billion in indirect expenses from, law, from things like loss of productivity. We also see that major catastrophes like Chernobyl and Exxon Valdez, a significant reason why these things happened is because operators were, had, were operating large vehicles or, uh, or very important machinery at a period of the day where they had very low wake drive very high sleep pressure, and in some of these cases, they might have had one glass of alcohol on board, and oftentimes the media wants to jump on them and say, these people are drunks and they're responsible, and the operator's like, gosh, you know, it was just one drink, and, but the combination of all of these together leads to a catastrophic, fatal errors. And it's important for us to understand this, because then potentially governments, organizations can implement regulations that prevent situations like this happening again in the future. So why are, these, why are these changes taking place so rapidly? Well, we have technology. I looked up a statistic that since the release of the iPad in Q3 of 2010, 154 million units have been sold. All right? Now, the mobility of that device has enabled us at home to do computing in new places. Right? Not at a desktop, not even at a laptop. We can now take it into bed with us and read about news, play games, whatever it is. This is affecting sleep time. All of the, by the way, all these things have been shown to significantly affect sleep time. Um, Mateus Basner and David Dinges, who is the chief editor of the uh, journal Sleep, um, has shown that as work times elongate, sleep times diminish. Same with commute times. When commute times get longer, sleep times go down as well. And same with, uh, with shift work. So 15% of the United States does shift work. And I think that, and that we typically think of shift work as somebody that maintains a work schedule for a couple times a week from maybe, let's say, 8 to 6, and then another shift from midnight to 8 in the morning at a different part of the week, or even a different part of the month. There's a new type of shift work, however, which affects a lot of us, which is people will go to work from 8 to 6 at night, they'll come home, they'll spend time with their family, and because of not having as much personal time for themselves, 
They put the kids to bed and then they spend at least a few days a week staying up very late at night, finishing emails, working on projects, finally having a little bit of time to themselves. This is a new type of shift work as well. And it's facilitated by longer work times, so less time with family and personal time, and also technology, Blackberries, iPhones, things that you can take with you everywhere. And also an attitude, a mindset. Um, up sluggard, waste not life, in the grave will be sleeping enough. This is a quote from Benjamin Franklin. And this is the idea that sleep is lazy, right? If you really care about what you're doing, you fight through it, you fight through sleep, right? So resist it. And actually I was thinking about relating this to some, something that Jeffrey Miller had said earlier, talking about conspicuous displays of fitness. So think about somebody, what they're saying, oftentimes it's somewhat ostentatiously like, Oh yeah, I was up till four in the clock, four o'clock in the morning last night, and, and, and look how well I'm doing. Or think about how well I would perform if I had a full night of sleep, right? So, oftentimes there's some machismo around this as well, and I think that this is going because of technology will continue to enable us to live a life of sleep deprivation. We need to fight back and make it a matter of personal responsibility, where we say, you know what, I take my job so seriously, I'm not going to work till four in the morning but I'm actually gonna to go to bed on time so I perform well during the next day. So there's a lot of way, sleep loss will affect all bodies, body systems and quality of life. And I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but it has a pervasive effect on our physiology and our well-being. So let's take a look at sleep history. This is history and milestones. So let's take a look back, and I think it's very illustrative to see how sleep was viewed before modern sleep medicine area and sleep research. This is a quote from Aristotle. The immediate cause of sleep is to be sought in the food we eat, which gives off fumes into the veins. The heat of the body drives these fumes into the head where they collect and cause sleepiness. Which is basically the conclusion of my talk. This is what's actually happening. <laughs> um, you know, I think sleep is very mysterious. We don't know what's going on. So you can imagine the creativity that has happened in the past. And in fact, you know, I had many more slides of this where there are where there are creative examples of what people thought sleep was. But the modern sleep era was ushered in with a few major discoveries. One of them would happen through uh, by uh, because of the discovery of Constantine Bonacanema, who was a PNE professor who was looking at a mysterious brain illness that was causing people to either sleep 20 hours a day or to have terminal insomnia. And what he found was lesions in the anterior and posterior hypothalamus, which he determined to be critical for the maintenance of sleep and wake regulation. And half a century later, scientists have discovered that indeed his interpretations were remarkably accurate. Another finding was from Hans Berger, who found that electrical activity could be recorded from the scalp. And this was a major finding for sleep medicine because uh, ultimately what we found is that as you sleep, the brain goes into different stages, and those stages can be recorded electroencephalographically. Additionally, other externally measurable signals like respiration, heart rate, muscle activity could be triangulated with these EEG signals, and you come up with something called a polysomnography, multiple measure of sleep measurement. And with, with this, we began to understand our own sleep physiology better, and we could see how sleep changes in humans across the lifespan. This is a publication by Howard Rothwerg in Science of 1966, uh, published it with Bill DeMent, who will speak of next. You can see the proportion of time that we spend in the sleep state or the wake state changes across the lifespan. And also the proportion of time that we spend in different sorts of sleep stages while we sleep also changes too. Additionally, the proportion of time we spend awake during sleep changes as we age as well. So life, excuse me, sleep normally changes over the course of the lifespan. And in 1970, Bill DeMent, who's considered the father of modern sleep medicine, um, founded the first sleep clinic. And this was at Stanford where they were started to see and treat patients that had sleep disorders. Now there are thousands of sleep centers around the world, and it's very easy for someone that has a sleep disorder to get help. And it's because of what happened, what Bill DeMent started not that long ago. And here's a funny quote from him. Dreaming permit, permits each and every one of us to be quietly and safely insane every night of our lives. <laughs> and lastly, um, this was an incredibly important model that was put forth by Alexander Bourbet, the two-process model of sleep and wake regulation. And 
this pu the publication was in a small journal in 1982, and to this day, it's the most cited sleep publication of all time. There's almost 2,000 citations. It's still cited today, and it has remarkable insight into how sleep and wake is regulated. I'm going to speak more about this soon. So let's talk about the sleep-wake cycle. What matters? And when I say matters, I mean what is the what what needs to happen in sleep that makes us feel like we got sleep. Right? And the things that matter are duration, the duration of the sleep episode, the timing of the sleep episode, and then the intensity. So duration, it's hard to see on this graph, but eight hours per night. Um, sorry, it's not showing up very well, I'll just explain it. Um, so duration is you can get one consolidated chunk of eight hours of sleep, or it can happen in two hours and, and six hours. Right? What is the total amount of sleep that you get? Timing is when does that sleep period occur, right? So you could sleep from midnight to eight in the morning one night, and then four to noon the next night, and that sleep, even though it's similar in duration, or identical in duration, is not going to be as restorative when you sleep out of phase. And then there is intensity, all right? And intensity is um, the, is, is a couple things. It is the, so the architecture, of sleep. This is, by the way, called a hypnogram. And it's looking at how we traverse the two different stages across the night. And the contiguation of one stage to the next is shown to be very important. And there are things that can actually suppress the amount of slow wave sleep that we get. There are things that can suppress the amount of REM sleep that we get. And there are also factors that can cause sleep to be fragmented, where you have rapid transitions between deeper stages into lighter stages or even to the wake stage. And either one of these are, go are going to cause you to spend, even though you get eight hours of time in bed and you get, and you're sleeping in the same circadian phase, you're not getting into the more restorative aspects of sleep. You're spending more time in shallow sleep. And all of these things is going to cause you to feel like you didn't get a full night's rest. All right, so what happens to sleep if you don't get enough sleep the night before or the week before? Well, sleep will change in a compensatory way to try to get to try to make up for lost sleep. So this is a study by um, Savon Banks: two nights of baseline sleep at eight hours, followed by five nights of up to five hours at bed. Okay, which is going to be sleep restriction for the vast majority of people. What happens to sleep after this period of sleep restriction? Well, you see that sleep that sleep the pressure that had built up over the course of the week caused people to sleep longer. But you'll also notice that all that sleep pressure wasn't worn off in only one night, right? It carried through to the next night, so people slept longer the next night as well. And what you can't see, and by the way, it only got back down to baseline after that, that four nights. What you can't see is that the time to fall asleep was reduced, the synchronicity of the sleep changed, and the architecture of the sleep changed such that certain stages happened before others. So a lot of things are happening to sleep after sleep loss to try to get you back to a whole, whole state, okay? Now what happens, this is actually one of the most interesting things that I've learned in the course of my study of sleep. Um, I'm gonna tell you about daytime vigilant performance. Now this is a, uh, a this study was done by Hans van Dongen and it looks at reaction time after sleep loss. Reaction time is usually you're holding something called a PVT, a psychomotor vigilance task, you're looking for a signal on a screen, and when you see that signal, you push a button as fast as you can, right? And the interstimulus interval, or the time between that signal changes. So you can't predict it, you just have to focus. And when you're sleepy, you can't focus for very long. Your mind drifts. The other thing that happens is you have lapses. The signal comes up, and you just miss it, right? You just miss it entirely. And the sleepier you get, basically the worse your performance is on this. Now, this, this is, the, the protocol had people under, uh, do zero, total sleep deprivation, no sleep for three days, and you can see a linear increase in misses. So they got worse and worse the more they were up. Then there was partial sleep restriction, where they had a little bit of sleep every day for a period of time. Now this is four hours, six hours, and eight hours. And what do you notice? You notice that in the four hour group, their vigilant performance was as bad at seven days as somebody that had been up for two straight days, right? 
And same, somebody that had, had only six hours per night, their performance was as bad as somebody that had uh, 14 days, as somebody that had been up uh, for two straight days as well. So what does this tell you? It tells you that the effects of sleep loss are cumulative. Mm -hmm. They accumulate day after day when you don't get the sleep that you need. Now, the other most more, you know, equally interesting thing about this, I find fascinating and actually very explanatory to some of the things that we discussed earlier, particularly about our modern sleep context, is what happens to subjective sleepiness. So PBT reaction time is objective. Subjective sleepiness is how you feel, right? Now, under total sleep deprivation, there's a nice linear correlation with misses in reaction time and how you feel. You feel sleepy and you perform poorly, but with four, six, and eight hours of time in bed, you see this type of relationship. This is thought of as a saturable coefficient. It gets worse up to a certain point, and then it doesn't get much worse after that. So what you have is a situation where you're not feeling that much sleepier, but you continue to have impairments in how, you, how well you perform. And this sets up a condition where you, have, you underestimate how impaired you are, and you overestimate your readiness to perform different tasks, like operate a large tanker ship or drive a car or be in a meeting. And do you think that this might explain some reasons why we're getting a lot less sleep? We can come be accommodate to less sleep and it feels somewhat normal, and it's actually changing our ability to perform really significantly. All right. So um, this is going to get a little hairy. We're going to talk about what's actually happening in the brain that is controlling sleep and wake. So, ah, gosh, these graphs look so good. Um, this is the, the orange dots are a group of uh, monoaminergic, cholinergic neurons in the central nervous system that form or are part of an ascending arousal system. Okay? How alert you are, how alert your cortex is, is because these systems are working sometimes in harmony to ascend into the cortex via two different paths, one that goes to the thalamus and one that goes directly into the cortex. Okay? And this is the model of how this works. You've got, um, and these are by the way, the neurotransmitter systems that are a part of the, neuro, the, the wake network. They're working, um, and hypocretin is, a very important player. Hypocretin was discovered um, by a colleague of mine, um, Luis de Licea and Thomas Kildoff. Um, the way to think of hypocretin is it's like the symphony conductor. It's telling the symphony when to play, when to be on. It's telling this wake network, it's daytime, be alert. Okay. Now, I think this is going to be a little bit hard to see, but a uh, The balance to this system is there's a different center in the brain called the ventral lateral preoptic area, which is thought of as the sleep center. Okay? This is the area of the brain that heightens an activity to initiate and maintain sleep across the night. Now these two systems, and you can see here the VLPOs, what these J's are is actually uh, with a different font, it shows that it's decreasing activity. So when the VLPO, the sleep center, activates, it inhibits hypocretin, and it also inhibits directly the wake network. And what you get is this uh, binary state. Right? You have you're either asleep or you're awake. This is a model of a flip-flop switch. Right? You're either in one state or the next. There are no transitional states, and there are some sleep conditions where you might actually be in transitional states. One example of that is hypnagogic hallucinations, which you see with actually most people can have them. Narcoleptics have them actually quite frequently. This is a state where people are awake, but they're dreaming over a wake state. And these hallucinations, actually the lab that I work with in the Netherlands, are actually quite different from schizophrenic hallucinations. But you can imagine when you know when do most people see alien, you know, aliens in the sky or um, I don't know werewolves or you know things things that are you know they say I really saw this. They're probably they're driving on a you know desolate freeway at night, they're probably you know, going into the sleep state and starting to dream over what feels like wakefulness and see what they see is real, or it, at least it appears real. So anyway, that mostly doesn't happen because of this mechanism. This is, these are, these, the states reinforce one another. So when the VLPO turns on, or my PowerPoint presentation turns off, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, 
they, it will quiet down the wake center. When the wake center is on, it keeps the sleep center off. And that's why you're awake during the day mostly. Doesn't mean that you couldn't nap during the day, it just means you're, you're either asleep or you're awake. Okay. Okay, so a little time to process that information. All right, so we've talked about, if we go back to Bourbet's model, this two-process model of sleep and wake regulation, and we think about it in the context of, well, how is that influencing the system of a flip-flop switch where they're in one state or the other? We talked about a circadian wake drive that waxes and wanes episodically across 24-hour period day to day. Right? It's on a circadian rhythm. And then there's this process S, this sleep pressure that builds up homeostatically, meaning that the longer you're awake, the more this theoretical process S builds up. What is that? What is that? Can we, is there anything that we can identify that actually is the correlate of this concept? And a hint, coffee blocks it. So we know that you know, ATP is the, you know, the currency for energy in, in the body. Um, astrocytes will release the purine nucleotide adenine once ATP breaks down into the extracellular space when, uh, as the brain uses energy during the day. And some work by Radhika Bashir and uh, Tara Porka-Eisen at Harvard clearly illustrated that in the basal forebrain, what you see, this is compared to control. Um, this is mice that stayed up one hour, two hour, and three hours past control. And this is adenosine levels in the basal forebrain. So what you see is that adenosine levels continue to go up as long as you continue to stay awake. And then with recovery sleep, those levels start to go down. All right? So this might be that correlate of process S in the brain. Now, we also know that adenosine will bind to A1 receptors on the wake network, causing them so the more you're awake, the more that it inhibits them, and it actually decreases their activity. Okay. Additionally, adenosine binding to A2 receptors will activate the ventral lateral preoptic area. So you can see as the course of the day goes on, the longer that you're awake, the wake center weakens and the, and the sleep center strengthens. And then that's what makes that, that flip switch. Okay. All right. So let's look at this actually in the context of this model because it, 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 it's very illustrative of a couple of cool concepts. Now, this is that two-process model that we were talking about a minute ago. This is process S, or sleep pressure. Now, once you go to sleep, just like Bashir's group showed, sleep pressure decreases back down to a baseline in the morning. Now, what happens, and you can notice that process C just stays on its, on its you know, sinusoidal curve. But what happens if you stay up an additional night? Well, you've got an additional amount of sleep pressure that's building. Okay. Now let's look at subjective sleepiness scores. Okay, this is 
the, the, the white area in this graph is daytime, and the gray area represents when people would usually go, be going to sleep, but they're staying up for 40 hours of wakefulness. Well, what do you notice? You notice that sleepiness, this is subjective sleepiness, how sleepy somebody feels, doesn't increase monotonically. It doesn't just keep getting worse. It gets worse to a certain point, right? And then it gets better. What's going on there? Well, that's because this, this, it gets, this, it's worse at this period of time where you've got the lowest level of circadian wake and a high level of sleep pressure, okay? And it gets better when wake drive starts to increase again, even though you've got sleep pressure that's still building, right? And this is, this is what explains why you're not just getting sleepier and sleepier, okay? It, it, it explains why if you've ever stayed up for a full night, you're probably sleepiest at four in the morning and maybe not quite as sleepy around 10. I mean, yeah, you could fall asleep for sure, but you, it actually gets better, all right? And that is, I think, a really good way to kind of experientially think about how this mechanism is working, at least relating it to your own experience, if you've ever stayed up before. All right, so let's talk about circadian rhythms. Now, we've evolved on a planet that has a, uh, a uh, has a 24-hour cycle of light and dark. And this is a sagittal section of the eye. Now, light enters into the eye, and it goes back to the retina. This is a schematic version of the retina, which we're going to turn on its side here. Now, there are seven different cell types and three different layers of the retina. Now, light, when it enters into the eye, it will go to back to the photoreceptors, rods and cones. And very, these are very specialized cells because they can transduce a photic stimulus into a neural signal, right? And that will travel via the optic nerve past the lateral genicular nucleus into the primary visual cortices where we see, we see things. It turns into images that we perceive. Now, in 1996, Ignacio Provencio discovered that there was another class of phototransducing cells in a different layer of the retina. And they produced a photopigment called melanopsin. In 1998, he had ended up publishing a paper in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences that showed that this, um, this actually communicated, if they produce a certain photopigment called melanopsin, and they don't communicate to the brain via the optic nerve, they communicate via something called the retinal hypothalamic tract. Right? So this goes back into the brain to communicate a light signal to a different part of the brain than photoperception. And this light signal will go into the hypothalamus and it'll affect the activity of the VLPO, or the sleep center. So when light enters the eye, it quiets down the activity of the sleep center. Now think about people bringing iPads into their bed and thinking, I'm just going to read until I feel sleepy. You're blocking, you're masking sleep in some way. All right. Additionally, that signal will also go to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is considered the master clock of the body or the light and trainable oscillator. Light tells this master clock what time of day it is. So this master clock is synchronizing with the light dark cycle of the environment. And then we have clocks throughout our body. So there's two levels of synchronization that takes place. The light and the brain with the light dark cycle of the environment, excuse me, the eye and the brain of the light dark cycle of the environment. And then the master clock with clocks throughout our body. And that's how our body knows what time of day it is. It does it by affecting clock genes. So when light is there, it affects the transcription and translation of feedback loop of these clock genes, right? And when the absence of light, a different signal is provided. And that darkness signal is reinforced through this multisynaptic loop that eventually produces melatonin. Melatonin will tell the, these eternal clocks, or excuse me, these eternal um, clock genes, hey, it's either dark or light, all right? And under the control of circadian rhythms are a lot of behavioral and physiological processes, right? Alertness, autonomic nervous system, mood, uh, locomotor activity, hormone activity in particular, or well, at least very strongly, I don't know in particular, but very strongly, cell cycle and repair. So this is an entrained melatonin cycle. Now melatonin is an excellent marker of circadian phase because it's not influenced by that many other things versus then light, all right? So what I mean by that is that day after day, you're seeing that the rhythm is happening at the same time. Now here is an example of multiple rhythms superimposed on each other as an example of, and by the way, there's many of these rhythms. I mean, you couldn't even see this if, I, if you try to put all of them on there. 
it would just be this complete mess. But this is, uh, uh, let's see if it's working here. Uh, but fortunately, not really. But they, uh, what I tried to do is highlight every individual rhythm. You're probably not going to see the next one, the next uh, part of it either. The point is, is that at 10 a.m. there's a particular phase relationship that that are that is established, right? There's a high level of cortisol and a low level of growth hormone and melatonin and sleep. And at 11 p.m. there's a high high level of melatonin, slow wave sleep, and growth hormone and a low level of cortisol. And each one of each time period creates a very unique metabolic signature that tells our cells direction. It's like a lock and a key, right? So when you mess up the phases of our, of, you know, you get out of phase, you have a misalignment of your hormones. It's like a symphony that is playing out of rhythm. It's a cacophony of sound instead of a, you know, a good a good rhythm that you enjoy listening to. It's discordant. Okay. So this is also a little hard to see, but. This was an entrained photo period where every day the melatonin rhythm is happening at the same time. Okay, this is an example of what's called thank you a free running rhythm. The free running rhythm is if you were in complete darkness, humans have an internal circadian rhythm that is longer than 24 hours. So, in, without the uh, light providing a signal to tell your body, hey, stay in this phase, it start, our own internal phase starts to shift. And this has been demonstrated many times. One of the first people uh, was this guy who went into a completely dark cave and they came out and they would measure hormone levels after like months at a time and you would see that they were completely shifted. So, and, and it's been, you know, that was like the first you know, example of that, but it's been demonstrated in the lab many times. So that, this is one thing. If you don't have proper stimulation to anchor your circadian rhythms, they can drift. Additionally, light can both advance your rhythm. So in the absence of stimulation, your rhythms can drift. And then light is the primary anchor of circadian rhythms. And that can also, if mistimed, can actually cause your rhythms to shift, advance, or to delay. So if you have a free running rhythm that, so for example, your internal clock is 27 hours, your tau, that is the length of your internal cycle, and you're getting light at night, your rhythms can shift significantly on a day-by-day -day basis, three hours, four hours, okay? Now, earlier I put up a, you know, a slide that was hard to see, um, and I showed the consequences of sleep loss, and uh, you know, you might have had a chance to just kind of spot a few, you know, the scary conditions. This is. This is some consequences simply from circadian misalignment from a mistimed lighting. And you see that there are physiological things can end in, in fatal conditions like cancer, and the behavioral and mood things can end in fatal conditions like car crashes. So, you know, this has, again, light itself has very powerful influence on health, physiology, well being. Okay, so we have 10 minutes. Um, this is going to be tough. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. It's kind of nice because this kind of pulls a lot of this together. So let's see how far we get. Um, we know that you know weight is weight gain is one of the scariest public health issues of our day. Since the '60s, the average percentage of the population that is obese has gone from somewhere around 13% to over 30%. I think it's close to like 34% now in a very short period of time. And so. Of scientific interest and public health interest to understand what's what could be driving this, and right now we've seen that 89, 81 out of 89 studies that that are cross-sectional and longitudinal have found a positive association between low sleep, usually around six hours, and an increase in, in weight. Right, so there seems to be a pretty clear, consistent relationship between sleep loss and weight. Now, and this risk, by the way, it, it will increase your risk for for obesity by about 50%, 55%. So investigation into the mechanism started around uh, you know, the late 1990s. A lot of work done out of the University of Chicago by a variety of research, researchers, Evan Cotters, one of the, the leading voices in space. And this is a normal glucose, normal glucose regulation over a 24 hour. Right? So you see that during the day, there are dips in glucose regulation between meals. But overall, the rise in glucose level, the, there's a rise in glucose levels from morning to night as glucose tolerance diminishes. 
But at night, if you don't see as much as much peaks and troughs, there's a different sort of profile. And the reason being is because there are these counter-regulatory hormones that are released during sleep to maintain, to maintain the level of blood glucose. In the beginning of the night, it's growth hormone release that happens during slow-wave sleep. And in the latter half of the night, it's cortisol rhythms that are, that are actually starting to ascend. All right, what we know about sleep loss is that with sleep loss, it appeared to show a phenotype that was like pre-diabetic. So you saw that there was 40% in the morning after sleep loss, and this is six days of pretty severe sleep restriction, 40% slower glucose clearance and 30% lower glucose effectiveness, which is the ability of glucose to clear itself independent of, you know, of insulin, right? Now this was, okay, hmm, what's going on there? But why again would this cause weight gain? All right, so this was an exciting first sign, but answering that question, you know, we didn't really know what was going on. But we also know that there are cells in the central nervous system that will sample the blood. They're called model metabolic integration neurons. Now they are looking at neurotransmitters, metabolites, hormones, and they're integrating these signals to affect upstream and downstream uh, neuronal activity. All right, so an example of why this matters is hypocretin neurons. So a uh, friend of mine, Dennis Burdekoff in Oxford, has shown that, remember, hypocretin neurons, those cells that tell the wake network when to play, well, they are inhibited in the presence of glucose. Okay? Glucose decreases their activity. So, do, you know, it's, I've heard many times before, well, you know, you're sleepy after lunch because you have a glucose meal because blood, blood sugar is, you know, decreasing. Actually, it might be because blood sugar is present, right? Because it's inhibiting this wake driving network system. Uh, and so yeah, so we see that they're inhibited in the presence of glucose, and these interactions may be the phenomenon of hunger-induced arousal and after meal sleepiness. So when you fast, it also might be the mechanism of why you're more alert. Now could this be involved in also driving hunger? Now this is totally speculative. I, I, we don't really have no idea, but it is, by the way, I have only talked about hypocretin neurons influence wakefulness, but they also influence, they also influence feeding behavior as well. So it's possible, but we don't know. Next, we also, there was a discovery of that uh, homeostatic hormones like leptin and ghrelin are also altered after weight loss, uh, excuse me, after sleep loss. So you see a flattened profile of leptin with sleep loss versus sleep extension or normal sleep. So there's a, there's a diminished area under the curve and a shorter peak, and the next day, you see reduced leptin and increased ghrelin. Now, both of those are going to increase energy uh, hunger and diminish energy expenditure. Right? So you would think, after sleep loss, you're gonna be hungrier and expend less energy. That could be a mechanism by which you would gain weight. Now, the data on this is equivocal. Not all studies have shown this clearly, so it could, be a role, it could play a role, but we're not sure. What about energy expenditure? We know there's been also equivocal reports about how, about how sleep loss affects energy expenditure. Well, we know that um, this is just a really well-controlled study uh, by Rachel Markwald out of Kenneth Wright's uh, group in Colorado. And really hard study to do. 14-day inpatient, they had in that 14-day period, people reduced their sleep to five hours for four, four, excuse me, four or five hours for five days. And then they measured how much energy are they expending and what are they eating? And they found that people that slept less burn more energy. When you're up, you burn more energy. And then you also, they also ate more. But interestingly, they gained weight over that time. So that suggests that they ate more, but when you look at energy balance equations, that's not what it showed, right? So what else is going on? Well, if you look at the timing of food intake, you see that breakfast, there was a, re people ate less in the morning after sleep loss, they ate about the same at lunch, dinner, and daytime snacks, but they ate a lot more at night. Hmm, okay. So, could eating timing matter? Well, um, this is a study by Dina Arbel and Rats, where they basically, they just had one difference between two groups. They had a group of rats, that, two groups that were fed an isochloric diet. One group was fed when they usually eat, and the other group was restricted to eating only when they're usually sleeping. And what they found is that energy expenditure and energy intake was the same, but after two weeks, this is the top line, there was a significant difference in, 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 in um, body mass, and body weight, and it was mostly adipose tissue. So they were gaining fat. And well, that doesn't, you know, so they were burning the same amount of energy, or at least they were expending the same amount of energy, and they were eating the same amount of energy, 
what's going on. Well, follow-up studies by a group out of Oregon Health Sciences, Laura Fonkin, um, light at night increases body mass by shifting the timing of food intake, right? So that might be what's going on. And a follow-up study showed, it's very interesting, they took, two, they took two groups of mice and they maintained one group under a normal light dark cycle. The other group they maintained under a light, light cycle and then dim light, so they weren't have, experiencing any darkness. And what they found is that the light, dim light group started to eat more calories at night and started to gain weight. All right, but even, even then there was no difference in intake, so they're just eating later and it's changing how much, how, it's making them gain body weight again. So this is confirmation of a, you know, something similar that we saw with the ARBL study. So what's possibly going on here? And I, I know I'm running out of time, so. Um, we talked about the light and trainable oscillator of the suprachiasmatic nucleus, right? That is what, that is our master clock in our body. It exerts its influence on hormones and other, you know, other physiological processes uh, via some, uh, an area called the subparaventricular zone and the dorsal medial hypothalamus, okay? So it, it gets signals when it has, those, those cell groups do most of its work for it. Now we know that when you eat food, it can, at, at a, at a uh, time when you usually don't eat food, it can uncouple something called the food trainable oscillator from the light trainable oscillator. So you end up with, again, a symphony that is playing out of balance. So instead of a well-coordinated hormonal response at any individual slice of the day, it is out of rhythm. Now we know that mutations in clock genes can influence body weight. It can make, if you, if mutations of the clock gene can make animals obese. We know that during seasonally obese, and um, there are seasonal obese animals what happens in, in that condition. So during a certain time of the year, the amount of light goes down, right, in the environments during like the winter. And this is a time where animals will tend to all store more body fat so they can make it through to, they make it through the winter. Now, in this model, they've shown that um, they don't take in any more calories, but there's a diminution of dopamine signaling in the SCN and that will affect this downstream regulation of energy intake. And without any additional calories, they will get they will get fat. They'll store fat for winter. Now, whether that that mechanism translates to humans, possibly. At least if there's some examples that show some dysregulation of this area might be contributing to our own public health issue. Now, additionally, there's I had a, a larger section on this which I trimmed down, but I think it's very fascinating, which is increased hedonic drive. Um, I think this is one of the more fascinating areas, but when, we're, when we lose sleep, it changes the way that we think and process information. It reduces, uh, it affects information processing, meaning that information will get into the brain more slowly, so we, our reaction time decreases, but it also will shift how we interpret certain things. So what this study do, has done by Matt Walker's group is they sleep deprived people and then they put food images in front of them and under fMRI or functional magnetic resonance imaging, they looked at what parts of the brain lit up. And essentially what they found is that under a sleep deprived condition, areas of the brain that are involved in reward would have heightened responsivity to food images. And areas that are involved in cognitive control, so the area that usually says, oh, you know, oh, you love donuts, no, 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 you don't want to eat that, it's processed food, it's got gluten, whatever the, your reasons are, it inhibits you from engaging in a behavior, right, or it, and just attending to a response that you, know, you might have, like, oh, I like that, oh, and I shouldn't have it. You rationalize that you should not have that. And sleep loss seems to be shifting the balance so that you become more impulsive. I probably should stop there, I've got one minute. Um, uh, this is a study that I recently completed. I'll just kind of tell you the, you know, the conclusion. Uh, basically, what I did is I uh, sleep deprived people, I looked at the reaction time, and I correlated that with uh, a, variety, a variety of different impulsivity measures, memory measures, and what I had is um, I gave them a break, so I used intentional misdirection during the study. So I, for them, the study was about how well they performed um, the cognitive measures. The break was what I was really interested in, so I would weigh and measure these food products that I put in front of them before and after they arrived. And, I, and there were ostensibly healthy choices, like you know apple rings, and then there was also gummy bears. So there was almonds and then there were sugar-covered walnuts. 
And what I wanted to see was how healthy did these subjects think the individual items were and what did they eat? And basically what I found is that people that were sleep deprived were more likely to eat food that they rated as less healthy. And I call that defection. They were most likely, they're more likely to possibly defect from their own standards in a sleep deprived condition. And other research has shown in sleep deprivation something called effort discounting. You're less likely to work for something that you care about when you're sleep deprived. So lastly, you know, this is a model that I've put together that I hope to publish. It shows the interrelationships of all the things that I've spoken about. It's very complex. It's hard if, you know, if I had more time, I would walk you from right to left. But essentially, it's a very complex situation. But I think what's happening is sleep is creating a very unique physiologic and even cognitive situation that is enabling a disfavorable energy balance that's promoting weight gain. Um, it's speculative, you know, it's, there's a lot of things that need to be tested here, but it's a model, and models are great because you can test them, you can, you know, poke at them and see what works, what breaks, and then change them. But um, uh, sorry for rushing through the last part of the talk, sorry for some of the graphics, but thanks for your attention. Thank you, Dan, for the amazing presentation, and um, let's take a question or two while we load up the next um, PowerPoint. Excellent, Dan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, earlier on in the presentation, you showed when through the week a person might have sleep deprivation, and then on the weekend they'll sleep like 10 hours. Yeah. What does it mean if you don't? Mm. What does it mean if you never get that 10 hours back? You, well, you know, so the, yeah, it's a great question. How long can sleep pressure accumulate? And, and we don't know the answer to that question. Another thing, that same group is looking at a process of hysteresis. How, how many times can you repeat that process before you're unable, potentially, to uh, uh, you know, recover 100%? You might be able to do that three times in a row, but then the fourth time you're only recovering 95%, then 90%, you know? So there's a lot of unanswered questions. The hardest type of research is you know, the stuff that takes a long time. It's easy, it's not easy, but it's easier to do up to two week studies and then it's like very mysterious after that, you know? So, yeah, thank you. Dan, what's your opinion of this idea that if you sleep more frequently, your need for sleep is less? Like some people get polyphasic sleep and they say that they're not sleep deprived with less total sleep. Yeah, so I wrote a big article, uh, article on that for Rob Wolf. You can search for polyphasic sleep, Rob Wolf. And there's two parts. So, if you remember sleep pressure, it is adenosine and it decays in this exponential fashion, uh, this ascending exponential fashion. Paul, anytime you're ready. Yeah, yeah, and so you can basically make yourself feel less sleepy, but you're also not necessarily experiencing all the benefits of elongated sleep, things I didn't even talk about today, enhancement of memory, you know, immunological regulation. Um, so there's a lot of things not happening. I think it's a way to feel better in a period of less sleep, but it's not a way to get rid of, uh, obviate a sleep need, right? Cool, thank you. Everybody.